excited to be here as part of the Reliable Web Summit, where I see a lot of people thinking about different and better ways of building web applications that we're all used to. So today's talk is called The Immutable Web, which is an interesting idea, and it's something I didn't even think about two years ago. Um, but as I've been transitioning through industries and seeing different ways of building things, I've discovered an entirely new world that I want to share with everyone here today. So if you don't know me, my name is Stephen Fluin, and I'm Head of Developer Relations for a company called Chainlink Labs that builds a very cool product in the blockchain space called Chainlink. But today I'm really here to introduce everyone to the concept of blockchain. Uh, and just so you know a little bit about my background, I come from a team called the Angular team at Google, uh, where I've spent a lot of time building a lot of applications, and I, I feel like I have a fairly in-depth understanding of what it's like to be a developer. And so I want to figure out where are the places that developers are not seeing things, where are the blind spots, and start informing and filling in some of that background information. So today's plan, we're going to go through this in three parts. The first part is I want to paint a picture of what could potentially be a new world that you may not have seen before. Second, I want to talk specifically about the mutable web and say what the power is and kind of why this actually matters for developers. And then lastly, I want to help people understand where they can start. If you're interested in going on this journey, and figuring some of this out, uh, this will be very, very helpful for you. So let's start off talking about new worlds. So when I left the Angular team, there was a lot I knew about web development, and I felt like I knew everything. Um, but when I got into blockchain for the first time, they had this concept of immutability, which just kind of blew my mind. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page. I want to give a little bit of background in terms of what blockchains are and how they work, uh, so you can understand some of the things that I'm saying today. So uh, a little bit of a warning. Uh, everything I'm going to be talking about is possible today, but I will say that the, the blockchain or crypto industry is very, very young relative to web development, right? We've been building web applications for over 20 years at this point, whereas blockchain applications have been being built for five years or less. And so there's a ton of innovation, there's a ton of change going on all the time. And so uh, take everything I say uh, and do a little bit of research on your own if you're interested in getting into this. So I think it's really helpful to start off with a shared understanding of what a blockchain is. So a blockchain is a highly secure, reliable, and decentralized network that stores data, exchanges value, records transaction activity in a shared ledger, and is not controlled by a central authority, but instead maintained by computers all around the world. And so I'll call it a few things here. So this idea that the blockchain is a series of blocks, right? This is a ledger that has a shared definition of truth that is generated by a whole bunch of computers around the globe gives it a very bunch of very unique properties from the ability to be uh, kind of hack resistant. So it would be very, very difficult and very, very expensive to manipulate the network to very, very public and very transparent. Everyone in participating in the network can see what's going on. Um, whereas if you contrast that with what uh, I might be running on my own Google Compute Engine server, uh, you can't really trust anything I'm doing there. I could be manipulating the background, I could be uh, intercepting results on the way, I could be doing anything I want and you'd have no visibility into that. Whereas blockchains tend to be very, very secure, reliable, and decentralized that gives it a level of transparency that we may not be used to. There's lots and lots of blockchains out there, but I'm gonna talk about two specifically today because they're relatively well known. So Bitcoin is probably the most well known one that I'm just gonna talk a little bit about as a pivot uh, into explaining Ethereum, which is uh, another of the kind of top blockchains out there uh, that actually gives us a more of a compute environment that we're used to for building web applications. So if you've heard of Bitcoin before, you might know that it's powered by around 11,000 nodes at any given time. So these are all the computers that are spread out across the world powering the network, recording all those transactions, broadcasting it, and then every single computer is checking the work of all the other computers. Every block, uh, as it's called in uh, Bitcoin land, or in blockchain land, is mined in about 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes, a whole bunch of new transactions are recorded into the blockchain. And then after a few blocks, you can say, yeah, that's pretty sure that nothing's ever gonna happen. That truth is gonna be uh, recorded for, for all of time. Bitcoin gets a, a better app because it uh, uses a proof of work system. So if you've ever heard about all the miners all across the globe uh, using the power of a small country that is uh, called proof of work, where the computers are solving very, very hard problems to prove that they have the momentum and the uh, reach to actually be relied on to compute these transactions. Uh, and you can think of Bitcoin as a little bit of digital gold, right? Because the purpose and the function of the Bitcoin network is to move Bitcoin 
from one account to another account. So the way that I think about this is like, you've got an array of balances where anyone can create a new item in that array and that account can be sent money, it can send money from that. Um, so every public key that the user has out there identifies an account and a balance, and then every node in the entire network is verifying every transfer. If we contrast this now a little bit with the other second network that I mentioned, Ethereum, uh, Ethereum looks similar in a few different ways. So it's got around 11,000 nodes doing all that verification, but instead of a 10 minute block time, we actually have a 15 second block time. And so transactions are being processed much, much more quickly on the Ethereum network. Um, there, it's also proof of work today, but they're working on a migration to what's something called proof of stake, where instead of having to spend millions of dollars buying these mining devices, these mining rigs and high-end graphics cards in order to compute uh, and verify the network, uh, they're actually moving to a system where you can just basically um, buy the, the currency and then that gives you the ability, uh, instead of buying miners, you buy the currency and that uh, proves that you have the, uh, the buy-in and the stake in the network to make sure that the network is going to continue being successful. And I'll also say that Ethereum ends up being an application execution environment. And, and what does that mean? So you can actually run code on the Ethereum network. And so this, this is where we introduce the concept of smart contracts or decentralized apps or dApps. So you could think about the execution environment that lives on the blockchain as, imagine if you had a server that runs on the entire network. So every single one of those 11,000 nodes is a computer that is executing all of the contracts that get submitted and all the transactions that get submitted, uh, just like those monetary transfers. Um, so anyone can create, interact, and read any value in the network, um, which is very, very interesting. So let's actually take a look at these because when you start looking at the code of what these smart contracts looks like, it's not that different from a normal object-oriented programming language that you may be used to. So this is a contract written in something called Solidity, which is the language that uh, most developers use, and it's the, the language that's uh, being built by the folks uh, that are working on Ethereum. And so you can see, instead of an object like a counter, you could have a contract that's a counter. And so we'll uh, declare a public variable called counter within that, and I'll construct it, and I'll set counter equal to zero. And then anytime someone calls the increment method, I will increase that counter by one. So just like this would work in object-oriented programming, uh, this could be a, an object that exists on the blockchain, but the difference here is that I write this contract and I deploy it into the blockchain, and then anyone can increment that counter and anyone can read that value, right? Because I haven't put any sort of access controls here, and so, which you, you absolutely can do, but it immediately makes this at massive scale where anyone can uh, increment the counter, and you can ensure consistency, like this contract is going to work no matter what you throw at it on the Ethereum network. If we go to a little bit more of a complicated example or one that's very, very familiar for us as web developers, uh, you can think about a to-do list where uh, I have a mapping for maybe uh, messages to status numbers, and, like we'll call this the to-dos variable, and then we've got an array of messages. And so anyone can add a message, which then saves the message and says that uh, the message status is one. You can mark any message as complete, so we'll just mark that message as two, uh, or you can delete it and we'll mark it as zero to kind of uh, say, hey, don't render this, this has been deleted. Uh, and then anyone on that has access to the blockchain can list all those messages out and see those statuses. So this is how the blockchain works, but instead of running on a single computer, it's running on the entire network. So effectively you write a contract, you deploy that contract to a network, then you can perform any number of transactions you want or anyone else can perform any number of transactions you want. And at any time you can read the values of that contract. Um, and so you can see how this looks a little bit like an API that you might be used to building on the back end of your application. So one thing to know about building with the blockchain is that you actually need to interact with the blockchain. And so there's a couple providers out there called uh, Alchemy and Fura. These are providers where they basically give you a JSON API to interacting with the blockchain so you can transact, you can read values, those sorts of things. Or what's kind of cool about this is because it's all decentralized, you can actually run your own node, for example. You don't actually have to rely on any intermediate parties in order to see what's on the blockchain or to interact with it. You just need access to one of those nodes and that's what these providers uh, give you. So if we follow the, the path here, a traditional web application is gonna start with some sort of web interface. Uh, that web interface is gonna make uh, XML HTTP requests out to a server, and that server will likely refer to a database. And so it's a very, very similar picture when we look at the immutable web or the, the web that exists with blockchains where you've got a, a HTML JavaScript based application that's gonna, instead of interacting with a single API, it's gonna interact with any number of decentralized APIs that give you access to the blockchain and then everything you do is recorded in perpetuity across the entire network. And so 
uh, it's a kind of a different mental model on the back end, but from a front end, you can build very, very similar experiences. Um, and blockchain is a little bit different in a couple ways that I want to call out. So with blockchain, truth is greater than trust. So this idea that uh, when I go to my email provider, I am trusting that that email provider is going to keep working and that they're not going to take all my emails and spill them out on the internet or do something malicious or sell them. Like All of that is based on me trusting my providers. Whereas on the blockchain, everything is transparent, everything is decentralized, and so we have this concept of truth where I can actually see exactly what's going to happen with the applications that I'm interacting with, and I don't have to trust anyone. Right? There's no way for someone to um, write a contract and then kind of violate that contract because once it's on the network, it's, it's there permanently. Um, and you can still give modern web experiences uh, with this sort of technology. So I, I will warn you that I'm skipping a lot of complexity under the hood here. If you want to start building smart contracts yourself, uh, definitely reach out to me. I can point you in the right direction. There's lots of great educational resources across the internet, uh, including from uh, my team at Chainlink Labs. A couple of the oversimplifications I'm making are uh, networks have different properties. So I've talked about Ethereum, but there's actually tons and tons of networks that are trying to build and ship these programming environments. Uh, I'll say there's this thing called testnet, so it's kind of scary to have this immutable version of your contract that goes on under the internet that everyone relies on. And so there's these things called testnets where the, they basically remove the monetary element to it. Uh, and so you can deploy to a testnet, mess it up, try again, try it out, learn, grow, get better uh, before you're actually ready. Uh, and then the other last oversimplification is that payment is actually required. And so when I send a contract to the network, have to pay for the network to take that contract on. So you have to remember, if you're, even if you're just storing one variable, you're not just storing one uh, set of eight bits or 256 bits on a computer somewhere, you're storing on every single node of the network for the entirety of time, which is it's a very different mental model and that's why we have this, this concept of payment. So when you're running transactions, when you're creating contracts, those both require payment. Uh, viewing the status of a contract doesn't actually require any payment, and that's why it's actually great for web applications because you can read any of the data and then users end up uh, paying if they want to transact or do something. So let's talk a little bit about the power of immutability. What does this actually give us? Why is this interesting for us as web developers? So we, we've all heard of the concept of serverless, and this is kind of beyond serverless in a lot of ways. So you focus on your code, and then the network handles everything, right? There is no central point of failure. I do not need to worry about the CDN going down. I don't need to worry about Firebase going down. This thing is gonna stay up and it's going to be accessible by my users because there's no central point of failure, which is really, really nice, especially when we see these kind of massive outages happening where um, one of the cloud provider goes out and it brings with them half of the internet. Um, I'll also say that uh, these applications that you build are permanent. So that counter contract that I, I showed you, that will actually work forever, right? Assuming that we don't exceed the two to the 256 uh, numbers, uh, that contract is gonna keep operating whether or not I maintain it, whether or not I care about keeping a web server up, right? That history that is created every time it gets incremented is preserved and protected and available to everyone. You can't manipulate it, you can't go in. If, I, if I've set up permissions on the contracts that only I can increment it, no one else is ever gonna be able to increment that counter. Um, but there's also a, a weird kind of side effect to this, which is that I can't improve that or upgrade that contract. So let's say we, we do get near the number two to the 256 power. Uh, there's no way for me to increase that size or reset the counter or anything like that. It's just gonna do what it's gonna do as I originally wrote it and deployed it because that's the consensus that the entire network has for us. Uh, I, I mentioned this a little bit before, but the, the concept is that I'm gonna deploy to put that contract on the network, but then anytime someone wants to transact, so that means Anytime someone wants to actually interact with that contract in a way that's going to modify the data in that contract or interact with other contracts, the user ends up paying this thing that we call gas. So based on the size of the change and the compute power that you're actually using, you end up paying, which is, from a web developer's perspective, very, very weird because uh, lots of times we want to be paying for thing, everything on behalf of our users. But it's actually a very nice model where if you, for example, uh, have concerns about scaling, you can just let your users pay for all the work that the compute and the, the engine is doing, and you don't have to worry about that. And so it's kind of a shared model of responsibility, which is very, very nice. And so uh, I talked about the immutable web and this, this importance of decentrality. So you've got the HTML application, um, the access to the network, and then the all of the nodes that are processing and storing that network forever. But uh, you may have noticed that I didn't really touch on the HTML5 piece. Like, you can still host that on a Netlify, you can still host that on a Firebase instance, but if you do that, it's not fully decentralized. 
Um, so there is a solution to this out there. It's called IPFS, or the um, it's basically the interplanetary file system where it uses a similar network to a blockchain where every file that you add into the system is write only. So you can effectively, excuse me, you can read only. So you can put data in, it gets shod, and then it gets stored. You can say how long you want to store it for, but then across the network, that file can always be read and no one will ever be able to mutate it. Uh, and so again, this is powered by a network. And so even if I, as the creator, stop paying for it to be maintained, the network can still kind of hold on to that and make it available to everyone, which is very, very cool. So uh, if any of this was interesting to you, I want to give you a couple pointers on how to start getting into this. Uh, I would say give it a try. It's probably one of the best ways of uh, getting in. So uh, install a wallet. Uh, I'll just here recommend something called MetaMask, uh, which uh, counterintuitively for web developers uh, runs in your web browser. So you save and store keys that allow access to all these cryptocurrencies in the browser, which is kind of a, an interesting idea, um, but it's, it's based on really, really solid cryptography. Uh, then you can go and get funds. So as I said, to deploy a contract or to transact with a contract, uh, you need some of these funds. You can get uh, testnet funds for free. So testing is very, very easy. Uh, and then write some code. So go ahead and clone some of the, the code. I've got an example here, uh, bit.ly slash try blockchain. You can actually put into a, a web-based IDE called Remix. Uh, and then just deploy and play around and see if this is interesting. Um, obviously on top of smart contracts, if you get the data in the right shape, in the right position, you can then build any very powerful web application that you want to. I've, I've seen some very cool ones, including things, for example, where you could order a pizza from the blockchain, uh, all powered by decentralized services until it gets to the pizza provider that is. So this is, this is a very, very cool way of getting started. Um, just as you're getting started, keep in mind some of the downsides. So there's obviously a speed element here. So transactions take at least 15 seconds, right? Even if you're, you're paying for them, because uh, each block is processing every 15 seconds, at least on Ethereum. There are networks that are doing kind of real time processing, but uh, you'll have to go look into that a little bit more yourself. Uh, think about fees. And so uh, this is actually a big problem right now where everything you do as a developer ends up being a little bit currency entangled. So for example, to increment that uh, counter that we designed, on the Ethereum mainnet, as it's called, which is the, the biggest network with the 11,000 nodes, uh, that would actually cost me around $2 USD to just increment a counter. And so you definitely have to think about this mental model and make sure that it makes sense for your use case and your application. But there's lots and lots of networks out there with different properties, different pricing, things like that. Uh, Ethereum is one of the most expensive networks to deploy on. And I will say that a lot of things are pouring into the blockchain ecosystem right now. So there's a lot of money going to the blockchain ecosystem because it's such a new growing space. Uh, there's a lot of energy, a lot of passion. People are very, very passionate about this idea of decentralization, uh, not relying on trust, being able to access servers that are transparent and going to treat them with the uh, transparency that people kind of want. And there's just a ton of growth in the space. We, we see that the amount of growth every year, it's, it's nearly doubling. And so this is a very exciting space to get into. So thank you so much uh, for listening to my talk and for coming with me on this journey into kind of the power and the capabilities of an immutable web. Thank you so much. Hey, it's Joe Eames with ng-conf. If you like that video, be sure to click subscribe either here, or here, or somewhere over here. And if you're looking for something more, here's another video for you to watch here or, or there or somewhere.